What are three things that I would want to know before getting a green winged macaque? Hey guys, I'm Kaylin, the author of The Purple Bond, Get to Know African Grey and Cape Parrots, and my new book, <laughs> Feathered Splendor, all available on Amazon. I have over 22 species of parrots. I love my parrots. My mission is to help you improve your bond or get the right parrot for you. So let's talk about Rosie, our green winged macaque. Let's start by saying that Rosie is pretty much like the other macaws that we have had in a lot of ways. One difference is she's bigger because she's a green winged macaw and um, she's more mellow, which may be because she's a green winged macaw. I'm not really sure. Wait, freeze. I forgot to mention one thing about the green winged macaw and I noticed this with my other macaws is that they don't necessarily get along with other birds. Now, I don't find they go and pick fights, but I do find that Emerald isn't uncomfortable approaching Rosie's space, but a lot of the other birds are. I don't see Rosie looking to be nice to other birds, not that I'm she's looking to be mean to them, but the point is she's got a powerful beak, and so I would be very careful, I am very careful, about who she's around. That's really something to take into account. Now, if you are leaning towards, you know, yeah, the green winged macaw is too big for me. Here is Emerald, the little, little, hands macaw or red shouldered macaw. So the first thing I think you're gonna wanna know before getting a green winged macaw, especially if you're not familiar with macaws, is that with a green winged macaw, we're talking bigger. Bigger means Number one, this is the second largest bird in the whole Cytocene order or suborder. And that means that out of all the parrots, this is the second largest. So Rosie at a little over a thousand grams, she's about 1100, something like that. You know, she's pretty sizable. Uh, when I go for a walk with her, my back actually had to adjust because she's on one side and it's enough weight that it kind of like it required some building up some muscles for me because you know just carrying that weight on one shoulder kind of made me crooked so she's a significant size now when you have a bird that's a significant size what it means is number one that beak is bigger so as you can imagine that has some things that it means but um, one thing about Rosie is she needs more space right she needs space in other words She's not an apartment parrot, obviously, because um, her cage is, you know, I could stand in it. Her cage is tall and wide. It's like four feet wide, six feet tall, something like that. So she takes up space. In addition to the cage space, she kind of has like her personal, her personal space in the sense that if this beak can reach something, it becomes her space. So you really need that space for a bird this size. This beak also means that when she wants to call and be loud, I can hear it echo like across the way and kind of come back. And I'm kind of going like, how far does that sound go? So pretty loud. I don't know if it's just Rosie or if it's green wings in general, you could tell Rosie's usually actually not that loud. And so it's usually not a problem. She's really one of our quieter birds, except for when she makes noise, forget it. You, you, you know, you could probably hear it on the moon kind of thing. Now, because she's bigger, that also means that she needs more attention. Domestication is an interesting thing. Cats and dogs are considered domestic animals. Parrots are not. So what that means is that for me, it means that a cat and a dog are kind of used to us and used to our lifestyle. And they're also really familiar with us. Used to us and our lifestyle means that they're used to the fact that we're gone during the day, parrots aren't. They're used to us coming and loving on them and then doing something else, parrots aren't. The familiarity part of being domesticated also means that, you know, um, the last time I was getting a cat and we went to the shelter, uh, I couldn't believe how friendly the cats were. They were like coming up to us and acting like they already knew us. And of course, puppies and dogs are like that. 
oftentimes when you meet someone um, and they have a dog and you're not familiar with the dog, you're like, oh, can I pet your dog? And they're like, yes, but it'll lick you to death. He's going to love you to death. You know, they're, it's like they don't know you and they already love you kind of thing. With parrots, they don't have that because they aren't domesticated. So that means that one of the most important things to consider with the parrot is what's it going to take for them to become familiar with you so that you know them, they know you, uh, you, when they look at you, they don't register danger. They look at you and the way you would with you when you see a lion, right? You see a lion and you're like, oh, how do I get out of here? And, and that's what a lot of wild parrots would do. They'd look at you and they'd be like, I'm out of here. So how do you shift that? Because a dog you've never met is happy to see you. A parrot you've never met is like, stranger danger, stay away. So what I'm trying to say is with the smaller parrot, like let's say a lovebird or a parrotlet, there's still that domestication piece that isn't there. They still have to get to know you. They still have to become really familiar with you so that you can bond, so that you can trust them and they can trust you. But what I'm saying is, with a small pair like that, if you have a nice size cage and you don't see them too often, it's kind of not that big of a deal. With a larger parrot, it becomes a bigger deal. I think that my observation is their emotional component is higher, or sorry, their emotional IQ kind of thing, so that they need more interaction and they need more bonding. In order to stay friendly, familiar, and, and in a way as domesticated as they will be, you really need to be able to spend time with your macaw. So in general, that's true. Like the larger the bird, the more so that's true. So I've definitely got this going on with Rosie. Actually, I, um, I was watching a Chan the Birdman video. And if you're not familiar, he's phenomenal. He's out in LA. He has, I think like three hyacinths and four other birds. I forget. He's got six or seven macaws. Some are hyacinths, the largest bird. Uh, one scarlet, one green wing, like Rosie. And one of the things he says is he has to take them out flying several hours a day because his birds are free flighted and because they're a pack and that's the way the pack behaves. So it is something where if you really want to have a good connection with a green wing macaw, you're going to be needing to spend several times with or several hours with them every day. Number two. <laughs> This bigger beak also means that one thing I'd really want to know before I got one is they're destructive. Yesterday, Rosie reached some of my plants and that plant got a huge hedge trim to where she reached. I'm kind of surprised she didn't knock the whole pot over and kill the whole thing. But now that I think about it, she's done that before too. Um, she also reached the curtain on my wall. You can imagine that curtain has holes in it now. The parrots are really destructive and the bigger the beak, the more destructive. Plus the bigger the beak, kind of like the more they kind of need wood. I have heard, and I think it's true in my observation, that macaws need some wood to chew on to de-stress, to stay comfortable. Like the way if you were starved, you would get stressed out. And uh, you know, they, it's kind of the same with them. Like being able to chew actually is going to give them well-being. No chew, no well-being. So then they can get antsy. And so that's another thing to be aware of, you know, that this, therefore you got to keep this beak entertained so that it's not being destructive in your home. Because like a wooden chair, forget it. Um, and you have to be able to give them wooden toys or natural enrichment so that they can stay in that well-being place. A part of that, um, you know, is going to be number three. I think another important thing to know, because when I, the first time I got a macaw, nobody told me this. They need a nut fat diet. So that okay. means that in addition to their fresh vegetables and their pellets, this is a parrot that needs nuts. Now I have a very interesting thing to tell you about that. With nuts, you know, they need, um, for example, walnuts. It can be in the shell. It's better when they're in the shell. Pistachios, almonds, um, hazelnuts, you know, we don't give peanuts and we don't give Brazil nuts, I believe are the two in the shell because then they can have, oh, I forgot the, the word, but like a, a toxin, um, which is just a fungal toxin, which you can't see. You could put it in the freezer and you still don't get rid of it. So it's really important to make sure that you don't give them those nuts, but these birds need that nut of fat. Um, and, and like I was saying, no one told me. And like I was saying, the interesting thing is 
If you get a macaw mix of seeds and nuts, there's also seeds in there. I think that that's done for economical reasons. I don't think there's any reason to give a macaw seeds. So those macaw mixes, they have some nuts in them. They have maybe sometimes some dried fruit, which I'm not wild about, but okay. And then they have seeds and they'll have some seeds that are small that I don't even know if they can grab. And then they'll have some flower seeds, which is fine, but it's not really the fat that they need. I'm gonna confess that when it comes to fats, I don't have a good understanding. I know that there's different kinds of fats and I know that um, the fat you eat affects you. And the same is certainly true for a bird like Rosie. Now I do know that in the wild, um, green wing macaws, they can eat up to like 90% palm nuts and survive on that. So they pretty much just live up in the palm trees. If there's a hollowed out palm, they'll use it to uh, have a nest. And then if there's a palm with those nuts, they'll eat those nuts. Those nuts are, I think like high in maybe protein, like they're just super healthy for them and fat. And so um, they're pretty big and they'll eat those all day. So this is a bird that needs some nut fat. And so like, I don't know about those seed mixes. These are some important things to keep in mind because I think that it also means that, you know, you can get a macaw mix with those seeds if you have a green wing macaw, but I think it's better to give them more nuts in the shell. Again, that shell gives them something to break open. It gives them something to do with their beak, some of that natural enrichment. And I've noticed that sometimes she sits there and just sort of grinds after she eats the nut, she grinds the shell. So I think she's using it because I think it feels good and it's kind of like sitting there playing with wood, super good for her. So that means you really have to have a nut budget because the nuts can get expensive. A bird like Rosie can have about a half a cup of nuts a day. Frankly, I'm liberal with that. I'm not uncomfortable giving her more because I know that if it's the right nut fat, it's important for her diet. So there you have some important things. These are things that are gonna affect the lifestyle when you bring in a macaw. If you don't know how to handle a bird that is harder to bond with, be really careful. This is a bird that really um, requires a good parrot leader. So one of my favorite things is Caesar Milan talks about being calm and confident with your dog so that when he goes to a dog like that, the dogs behave with him. Why? Because the dogs pick up on his energy, his demeanor, and they want to follow a good pack leader. Well, I think parrots are the same. When I go to my parrots and I'm calm and confident, they behave very differently than when I'm scared. When you're scared and scared of a big bird, they're going to own you. They are notorious for being kind of like bullies, for knowing that they have the upper beak and that you're scared of that beak. So I think that's a really important aspect too, probably where I should have started. Maybe I'll put this at the beginning of the video. Um, maybe I'll just add right now, make sure that you catch the part about being the parrot leader because that makes a really big difference. You have seen Rosie's being really patient. She's hanging out with me. She's doing a great job, but you saw her put my finger in her mouth to see like that and I trust her. She's never really hurt me and it's just not a problem, but I do spend hours and hours with her every day. And you could tell that I'm not scared. You could tell, I mean, you know, when you have a macaw, you may not want to put them on your shoulder. I'm comfortable. I don't feel like there's any question as to who's at the top of this pecking order. So it's not a problem, but you really have to be able to get that under your hat, so to speak, and have the biggest feather Otherwise, that can be a really big problem with a big bird that screams if you leave them in their cage, if you're afraid to take them out, that you're scared to take out and maybe that's biting you and hurting you. Because after all, if that beak can open a coconut, these fingers are nothing in comparison. So those are the things you, know, you really have to take into account that you have to, your lifestyle is gonna be affected in the sense that you have to be able to be that top of the pecking order kind of thing. You have to be able to give them a lot of space, a lot of nuts, and a lot of time. I think those are the most important things. When you're looking at the lifestyle you want, if those commitments are too high, then a smaller bird, like for example, my hands macaw, might be a really great bird for you. 
I've heard some people have hence macaws in apartments. I wouldn't trust our emerald in an apartment. I think she's too noisy. I'd be afraid my neighbors would complain. But she has all the advantages of being a true macaw, although she's a mini macaw or a dwarf macaw. And so she can talk and stuff like that, but she also has the advantage of having a much smaller beak and in that way being much easier to handle. So here's to getting the best macaw for yourself or the best parrot so that you can have the most blissful bond because I like to say, I don't think there's anything better other than family and maybe like a really fulfilling um, career path. But otherwise there's nothing more fulfilling than having your feathered companion, someone who's like a best friend, but I don't think your best friend sleeps over night after night and you don't take care of them all the time. A bird. Yes. Now you're starting to get a sense. That wasn't as loud as she can go. Hi. Oh, she's preening me. Such a, a wonderful, loving, close relationship. So here's to you having the best relationship. If a green winged macaw is right for you, they're phenomenal. I love Rosie. If that's a little too much beak to handle, I understand. Look at something smaller.